Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about campaign finance in Edexcel A-Level Politics. I'm going to start by looking through the parts of the specification this video covers and the key potential essay questions you get asked in the exam. I'm then going to start by giving you an introduction to campaign finance in the United States, looking at what it is and why it's so significant in US elections, and a history of campaign finance in the US. I'm then going to look at key legislation and Supreme Court decisions in relation to campaign finance, campaign finance today, and finally looking at the debate over campaign finance and whether there should be greater regulation of it. The PDF you can see on your screen is part of an updated textbook on um, US politics on the Politics Explained website, where you can also find loads of other resources to help you in your politics A-level, including updated essay plans, updated textbook, textbooks for different parts of the course, and a place to sign up for tutoring if that's something you'd be interested in. So yeah, um, without further ado, let's get into it. So start with the parts of the specification this video covers. So this is in um, the US Democracy and Participation um, part of the Edexcel A-Level Politics US part of the course. And this is the third of uh, seven videos in this final chapter um, of the US course, um, looking at campaign finance. So in terms of the spec point, it's the role of campaign finance and the current legislation on campaign finance, including the McCain-Feingold reforms and Citizens United. And then finally, we're also going to bring in the role of campaign finance and difficulty in achieving reform and the role of PACs and super PACs and their impact on democracy when looking at interpretations and debates of US democracy and participation, um, just because it all fits in very well in terms of this video and it's all going to be kind of used in um, similar essays effectively. You're going to be using the similar evidence. So in terms of the key kind of questions you get asked, um, you get a 12 marker potentially comparing uh, party funding in the UK and the US, and you can also bring in campaign finance in relation to a lot of questions on democracy in both countries and potentially the roles and methods of interest groups as well. In terms of the essay questions, you get a pretty um, straightforward kind of question on, on campaign finance, so evaluate the view that campaign finance requires reform. But again, um, this content is also going to be really useful um, in, in other questions, particularly about the undermining of democracy um, in the US, and you can also bring it in um, to questions about presidential elections. So as with a lot of the US course, whilst there can be some specific questions just on this topic, a lot of the questions that are potentially going to come up in those 30 markers are also cross-cutting questions that span across a couple of different topics. And so it's going to be really useful and you potentially may be able to bring this into a range of questions, whether that's just as a paragraph in the essay or, or a couple of points or a few sentences. It's going to be really useful and you need to know different parts of the course really, really well. So starting off with an introduction to campaign finance in the US, starting off with why it's what it is and why it's so significant in US elections. So campaign finance refers to the funding of political campaigns with the intent of influencing the outcome of elections. Campaign finance is highly important in US elections, it's on a much, much bigger scale um, and it's much less regulated than it is in the UK. The high costs associated with running for office mean that candidates often rely heavily on fundraising to remain competitive. For instance, the 2020 presidential election was the most expensive in history, with an estimated $14 billion spent by candidates, parties and support groups. This immense expenditure reflects the intense competition and perceived importance of financial resources in achieving electoral success. So, how is it spent? Funds are primarily spent on various activities and resources essential for running an effective campaign. The largest portion is typically allocated to media advertising, including television, radio, and increasingly now also social media and digital platforms. For example, in the 2020 US presidential election, hundreds of million dollars Millions of dollars were spent on digital advertising alone, reflecting the growing importance of online engagement. Other significant expenses include campaign staff salaries, travel costs for the candidate and team, and event costs for rallies and fundraisers. Campaign funds are also used for essential ground operations, such as voter registration drives, canvassing, and phone banking, which are key to mobilising a party's and a candidate's supporters. Additionally, funds can also be spent on political consulting, research and polling to strategize, gauge public opinion and design the most effective electoral strategy. The spending decisions made by campaigns can have a big impact on their effectiveness and ultimately their success on election day. And this demonstrates the strategic importance of not only raising campaign finance, but also managing them effectively to maximize impact on votes. In terms of a brief history of campaign finance in the United States, in the early 20th century, 
corporate contributions to political campaigns were common, and even to concerns about corporate influence. The 1907 Tillman Act was the first major piece of legislation to prohibit corporations and interstate banks from making direct financial contributions to federal candidates. However, significant loopholes and lax um, enforcement limited its effectiveness. The real transformation in campaign finance legislation began with the post-Watergate reforms, notably the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 and its subsequent amendments in 1974, which established comprehensive regulations on campaign finance. These included limits on contributions and expenditures, disclosure requirements, and the creation of the Federal Election Commission for enforcement. Over the years, various legal challenges have shaped campaign finance, with landmark Supreme Court decisions like Buckley v. Valio and Citizens United, both of which we'll look at in more detail, significantly altering the landscape. The latter decision, for instance, allowed unlimited spending by corporations and labour unions, leading to the rise of super PACs and significant increase in campaign spending. These historical developments reflect the ongoing tension between promoting free political expression and curbing potential corruption through the scale of money in US politics and in the US electoral system. So that's a bit of an introduction to campaign finance. We're going to look at a lot of things we've touched there in a lot more detail now, starting with key legislation and key Supreme Court decisions. So first, having a look at um, the FECA and how it was undermined. So the Federal Election Campaign Act was a pivotal piece of legislation introduced in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal, which involved a break in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters and a subsequent cover up linked to President Nixon's re-election campaign. Its primary aim was to restore trust in the electoral process by implementing transparent and fair campaign finance practices. The FECA also created the Federal Election Commission to enforce these new roles. Um, the Act represents a significant effort to regulate the influence of money in politics, ensuring a level playing field and preventing corruption or the appearance thereof in federal elections. In terms of its key provisions, um, first of all, there were contribution limits. The Act imposed strict limits on monetary contributions to federal candidates and political parties. It restricted individual contributions to $1,000 per candidate per election and $25,000 in total contributions per year. Political action committees formed by corporations, unions or other interest groups were limited to $5,000 per candidate per election and $15,000 annually to a political party. Crucially, um, one of the most significant aspects of the FECA was uh, the requirement for detailed reporting on both contributions and expenditures. Candidates, political parties and PACs were um, required to regularly file reports disclosing the sources of their funds and how these funds were spent. This transparency was aimed at deterring corruption and allowing the public and media to scrutinise campaign finances. It also introduced uh, a system for public financing of presidential campaigns, available to candidates who met certain criteria. To qualify, presidential candidates had to raise a specific amount of funds from a minimum number of states. In return, they received match funding for primary campaigns and a set amount of general election um, campaigns, provided they agreed to limit their total spending. The introduction of public funding for presidential elections was notably utilised in the 1976 election where both Ford and um, Jimmy Carter received federal funding under the new system. The system aimed to level the playing field, particularly in the primaries, and reduce candidates' dependence on large donors. So through kind of uh, candidates limiting their overall spending um, and um, raising a certain amount from a certain number of states, they were able to receive match funding um, from the state which meant they needed to raise less overall. Okay, in terms of um, the first key court case then, um, is Buckley v. Vallejo. So just two years after the FECA's enactment, the Supreme Court case Buckley v. Vallejo began to undermine its provisions. The court held that while contribution limits to campaigns were constitutional as they could prevent corruption, limits on campaign expenditures violated the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech. And this effectively opened the door for candidates to spend unlimited amounts of their own money um, on their campaigns. For instance, Donald Trump in his 2016 campaign spent approximately $66 million of his own money. The concept of soft money further undermined um, the FECA's effectiveness. Soft money refers to funds raised by political parties for, quote, party building activities like voter registration and issue advocacy, rather than directly supporting federal candidates. And these funds weren't subject to the FECA's strict contribution limits or disclosure requirements. And after the um, 1979 amendment, the use of soft money proliferated, leading to skyrocketing campaign spending. 
Political parties and candidates exploited this loophole to raise significant sums, contributing to an escalating arms race in campaign funding, financing. This loophole um, diluted the impact of the FECA as it allowed large unregulated sums to flow into the political process, thereby increasing the influence of wealthy donors and special interest groups. In the 1996 presidential election, the Democratic National Committee raised an unprecedented amount of soft money, um, around $122 million, and this soft money effectively is defined not um, as directly supporting federal uh, candidates, and therefore not as um, direct contributions um, to the um, to the to the candidacy, and therefore it got around the rules. For example, a key example which you see a lot today is spending on, on media advertising that isn't specifically endorsed by the campaign. So the money doesn't go directly to the campaign, but it's clearly um, in support of one candidate against the other. The Republican Party raised $244 million in soft money contributions in the 2000 election. In terms of the, the scale of campaign finance, so the increase in scale of campaign finance in US elections gradually reduced the need for publicly matched funding, further diminishing the power of the FECA. The option for public funding, which was a key component um, of the legislation, became less attractive to candidates as the amount of money required to run a competitive campaign far exceeded what public funding could provide. For instance, in the 20, 2008 presidential election, Obama opted out of public financing, raising an unprecedented $745 million, which far outstripped the public funding limit. So if he'd taken the public funding and accessed it, um, he would only have been able to match it one-to-one, -one, and therefore it had an overall much smaller pot um, in order to, to fight the election. This trend continued with all major candidates in subsequent elections uh, also opting out of public funding. So you see the FECA. Um, is largely defunct and largely has little impact today. Due to this kind of Supreme Court cases, the rise of soft money, and kind of got around the FECA, and also just the increase in scale of campaign finances. So the escalation um, in campaign spending made it difficult um, for the FECA to achieve its original goals of limiting the influence of money in politics and promoting electoral fairness. Okay, so the FECA were the kind of first real attempts and legislation to, to limit and uh, regulate campaign finance. The next key um, reforms is the McCain-Feingold Act. So the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, commonly known as the McCain-Feingold Act, was a significant bipartisan effort to reform campaign finance. It was introduced by Senators John McCain and Russ Feingold, um, and the act aimed to address the rampant use of soft money in political campaigns, which has obviously got around the FECA. Um, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act represented a concerted effort to curb the influence of wealthy donors and special interest groups in elections and enhance transparency and political financing to improve democracy and elections in the US. In terms of its key provisions, um, it banned um, national party soft money. Um, so it banned national part political parties from raising or spending soft money. And this change was intended to close a loophole that allowed large unregulated contributions to influence federal elections indirectly. It also increased contribution limits, so recognising the inflationary pressures and the increasing cost of campaigns. Um, it also increased the limits of contributions that individuals could make. So it doubled the individual contribution limit to federal candidates to $2,000 per election and adjusted this limit um, for inflation in future election cycles. In terms of restrictions on issue advocacy ads, um, the BCRA sought to regulate issue advocacy ads, which refer to advertisements that discuss political issues but don't explicitly endorse or oppose specific candidates. So this is kind of what I was um, talking about as kind of a key, key aspect of soft money. And the Act introduced the electioneering communication provision, um, which restricted broadcast ads that refer to a federal candidate within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election and are targeted um, to the relevant electorate. This was aimed at preventing use of issue ads as a backdoor means of corporations and in unions spending a large amount of money to influence um, electoral outcomes. Despite its intentions, um, it faced challenges due to loopholes, particularly involving 527 organisations. So these tax-exempt groups, named after Section 527 of the Internal Revenue Code, were not regulated by the BCRA, as they purported to engage in issue advocacy rather than the explicit electioneering. However, many 527s were effectively involved in campaign um, activities, even if legally they were able to get around it, influencing elections without directly advocating for or against a specific candidate. 
For example, during the 2020 election, the Lincoln Project spent over $67 million attacking Trump without specifically um, endorsing Biden. It was therefore able to spend these massive sums um, of money um, without kind of officially endorsing a candidate and therefore getting around the McCain-Feingold Act. The loophole allowed substantial amounts of money to flow into elections indirectly, undermining the spirit of McCain-Feingold reform. So you see this with the FECA and the McCain-Feingold Act. Um, very good intentions and attempts, um, but key loopholes, soft money, and simply getting around its key provisions allows campaign finance and big money from corporations and very wealthy donors in particular to always find a way to influence elections. Um, and Canada's always going to be open to it because it helps them win the election. The most important um, Supreme Court decision um, in relation to campaign finance um, was in 2010, and this was Citizens United versus FEC, which has come up a number of times across the different um, parts of the course um, in previous videos, in particular in relation to the Supreme Court. We'll look at it a little and in a bit more detail in relation to campaign finance. So Citizens United uh, dramatically altered the campaign finance landscape. It ruled that corporate funding of independent political broadcasts in Canada elections could not be limited due to the First Amendment. This decision um, led to the rise of super PACs, which could raise and spend unlimited amounts of money on behalf of candidates as long as they operated independently and didn't coordinate directly with their campaigns. They're funded by wealthy donors, labour unions and corporations, and therefore the kind of limits in both the FECA and the mccain Feingold Act to limit individual contributions to campaigns or corporate contributions to campaigns were effectively um, defunct. As these kind of super PACs um, were allowed to spend as much money as they wanted. And that was simply because spending money as a corporation or a wealthy individual um, was defined as free speech and therefore due to the constitution it couldn't be limited. The implications were profound as seen in subsequent elections where super PACs have played a major role spending hundreds of millions of dollars. The 2020 election saw unprecedented super PAC spending with groups like America First Action supporting Donald Trump spending around 200 million dollars and priorities USA Action backing Biden and spending around 130 million dollars. The 2014 case, um, McCutcheon versus uh, FEC, further eroded campaign finance regulations. The court struck down the aggregate limits on how much the individual could donate to federal um, candidates, PACs and parties over a two-year period. This decision allowed wealthy individuals to contribute millions of dollars across a wide array of candidates and committees, significantly amplifying their influence in the political process. And you see this with certain wealthy individuals, billionaires um, in the US, having a massive impact um, on elections through the scale of financing they're able to offer. Sheldon and Miriam um, Adelson were among the largest individual donors in the 2020 election, contributing over $90 million to various Republican courses and candidates, including substantial support for Trump's re-election campaign. And Michael Bloomberg, um, running initially as a Democratic candidate and later supporting Biden, spent over $1 billion of his own money on his presidential campaign and later in supporting Biden after he dropped out of uh, the Democratic primary race. Then the final, um, more recent um, court case, these second one, the second and third ones are a bit less important, the kind of Citizens United case was by far the most important. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled in favour of Ted Cruz um, in 2022, striking down Section 304 of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, and allowing candidates to use post-election funds to repay personal loans they made to their campaigns. And this was seen as further loosening the restrictions on campaign financing, potentially increasing the influence of the wealthier candidates who can afford to lend substantial sums of money to their campaigns and then simply pay them back later. So again, as we saw with the FECA, with the McCain Fund Gold um, Reform Act, very kind of clear intentions to limit campaign financing, improve elections, improve democracy, was fundamentally undermined by loopholes and ultimately um, by the Constitution, as the Supreme Court effectively defines, or did at least did in the um, Citizens United um, case, particularly the current Conservative Court, um, defines um, kind of spending um, money in elections, whether you're a corporation or a wealthy individual, as free speech. Therefore, it can't be limited um, under the Constitution and the kind of massive um, amounts of money used in US politics um, and that has influence on the outcome of elections continues, uh, particularly um, since the kind of Citizens United case through um, super PACs. OK, if we have a look at campaign finance today, um, the first key way to kind of, I thought I'd define it is huge amounts of money and little regulation. 
and, and this is kind of really linked into the, the ineffectiveness of these kind of um, key acts we've looked at. So the scale of campaign finance is staggering and is only increasing. 2020 presidential election was the most expensive in history with $14.4 billion spent by party, part, candidates, parties, PACs and super PACs. The 2020 midterms also reached a high for midterm elections with total expenditures exceeding $8.9 billion. Particular, political action committees and super PACs continue to be dominant. These entities have transformed campaign finance, often overshadowing traditional fundraising by candidates and parties. Super PACs in particular have become a pivotal force following Citizens United, and they can raise and spend unlimited amounts, leading to significant financial influence. For instance, in the 2022 midterm elections, super PACs like Senate Majority PAC and Congressional Leadership Fund spent hundreds of million dollars supporting Democratic and Republican candidates respectively. In the Georgia Senate race alone, which is a particularly important race um, for who was going to gain control of the Senate, over $250 million was spent by candidates and over $235 million spent by outside entities, in particular super PACs. George Soros, who is a big Democrat donor, alone spent over $178 million. Very little regulation. So since the McCain-Feingold Act, there's been uh, little to no significant federal legislation addressing the challenges posed by the ever-increasing scale of campaign finance. As has been shown above, McCain-Feingold itself has been ineffective in light of legal challenges, legal loopholes and the rise of super PACs. And attempts at further reform have been stopped by a combination of political partisanship, legal challenges and differing interpretations of the First Amendment's free speech protections. The current regulatory framework, primarily overseen by the Federal Election Commission, has been criticised for being ineffective in managing the modern realities of campaign finance, often deadlocked by partisan divisions among its members. How likely, then, um, is reform? Reform efforts face significant challenges. The polarised political climate makes bipartisan agreement on campaign finance more difficult. And moreover, Supreme Court rulings like Citizens United have set legal precedents um, that protect many current practices under the banner of free speech. Therefore, any kind of key legislation that is introduced um, to kind of try and kind of limit campaign finance would potentially um, simply be struck down um, by the Supreme Court under this interpretation of the First Amendment. Advocates for reform argue that the current system leads to undue influence by wealthy individuals and special interest groups, potentially undermining the democratic process. However, achieving substantial reform would likely require either a shift in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution, significant legislative action, or both. Money is a major part of fighting US elections, and it looks like that's here to stay. The key thing to have, to have a look at, though, which is kind of potentially a little bit more encouraging, is that small donations, typically defined as contributions of $200 or less, have become an increasingly important aspect of political campaign funding in the United States. Certainly not as important as super PACs or wealthy individuals or corporations, but it is increasingly important. The rise of digital platforms and social media has significantly enhanced the ability of candidates to reach a broader audience and solicit small donations from a large number of individuals. This democratisation of campaign funding um, allows candidates to rely less on large donations from wealthy individuals and super PACs, potentially reducing the influence of big money in politics. While small donations offer a more democratised form of campaign funding, the impact of wealthy individuals and super PACs remains significant. These entities can contribute and spend vast sums of money, which can be crucial to influencing election outcomes. In terms of examples of uh, the role of small donations, Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign was a pioneering example of leveraging small donations coupled with the effective use of social media to drive a successful campaign. A significant portion of his campaign funds came from small donors, showcasing the potential of grassroots funding in a major political campaign. So it was spearheaded by, um, by Obama. The way it really became um, evident that he could have a lot of power were actually in Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, both of whom have kind of, were kind of cult figures for certain parts of the political spectrum and received significant and continue to receive significant personal support. So Sanders' campaign, particularly in 2020 um, campaigns, particularly in 2016 and 2020, were notable for their heavy reliance on small contributions, reflecting his appeal to a broad base of grassroots supporters. In 2020, he raised nearly $180 million for his presidential bid, over 54% of which came from small individual donors. And these were, of course, his, uh, his uh, primary campaigns in the Democratic race. Trump's campaigns too garnered substantial support from small donors, demonstrating his ability to mobilise a loyal base of supporters, often facilitated by digital platforms and social media. 
In 2020, Trump raised over $378 million in small donations for his presidential bid, which is 48% of his total source of funds um, for his um, for his campaign, effectively. Of course, that's not necessarily also super PACs, um, which indirectly um, can support his campaign, but can't directly do so. In terms of the 2020 election, then, um, is a landmark event in terms of campaign financing, breaking records and highlighting the evolving nature of political fundraising and spending in America. The election was the most expensive in history, with total spending support, total spending surpassing $40.4 billion. This includes spending by the presidential candidates, their parties, and outside groups like super PACs. Biden's campaign set a record in fundraising, collecting over a billion dollars, and this included a massive influx of online donations, especially in the later part of the campaign. Trump's campaign also raised a significant sum, though slightly less than Biden, with totals reaching around $800 million. The 2020 election saw unprecedented super PAC spending, with groups like America First Action supporting Trump with around $200 million, and Priority USA Action backing Biden with around $130 million. In terms of individual donors, as we've already looked at, on the Republican side, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson were some of the largest individual donors um, in, in the 2020 election, contributing over $19 million to various Republican course and candidates, while Michael Bloomberg, initially running as a Democratic candidate and later supporting Biden, spent over a billion dollars of his own money. The final thing we're going to have a look at that, then is a debate in relation to campaign finance, in particular whether there should be greater regulation of campaign finance. So in terms of arguments that there should be greater regulation of campaign finance, the first key argument is that it would reduce the unfair influence of wealthy donors and special interests. Wealthy individuals and special uh, in interest groups can exert disproportionate influence on the political process through large financial contributions. This can lead to a system where policies favour the interests of a few rather than the broader public good. The fossil fuel industry's significant political, political contributions can be seen as having influenced US environmental policies. The Trump administration received substantial support from the industry. For example, the CEO of Murray Energy donated $300,000 to Trump's inauguration. Following these contributions, the administration undertook several industry favourable actions, including the repeal of the Clean Power Plan. It's not to say it was directly because of these contributions, um, but they likely have an impact um, in kind of uh, influencing, at least somewhat, in a little bit, um, um, the policies of the major parties. Greater regulation could limit the size of contributions from individual donors, thereby reducing the potential for wealthy individuals to wield excessive influence over candidates and policy decisions. It ensures a more level playing field where the voices of regular voters aren't overshadowed by a few wealthy contributors. Secondly, it will promote transparency and public trust in the electoral system. Lack of transparency and the huge amount of money in campaign finance lead to distrust in the electoral system. Voters may feel that elections are unfairly influenced by hidden financial powers, undermining the democratic principle of equal representation. The concept of dark money and use of 527 organisations, as seen in the, in the loophole in the mccain final Act, allows for significant sums to be spent without full disclosure. For example, the Lincoln Project spent $67 million um, in 2020 without full transparency about their funding sources, as they aren't subject um, to kind of the FEC. By enforcing strict disclosure requirements and transparency standards, the public can better understand who is funding political campaigns um, and advertisements. And this is key um, for building public trust in the democratic process and ensuring that voters are fully informed about who's trying to influence their opinions and votes. And finally, it will improve democracy and make winning elections less dependent on funding. The current system can disadvantage candidates who don't have access to wealthy donors and large political action committees thus limiting the diversity of viewpoints and options available to voters. In the 2020 election, while Bernie Sanders raised nearly $180 million, a significant portion from small donors, he still faced significant challenges competing against candidates with substantial super PAC support. This highlights the difficulty for candidates relying primarily on small donations to compete with those backed by wealthy donors and large PACs. In the 2022 midterms, 93.38% of House races and 82% of Senate races were won by the candidate who spent the most. Great regulation in campaign finance, including caps on spending and contributions, can help level the playing field for all candidates, regardless of their financial backing. On the other hand, it can be argued that, that there shouldn't be greater regulation of campaign finance. First of all, it can be argued that it would infringe upon free, of spe free speech and political expression. 
campaign contributions and spending are viewed as forms of political expression and protected by the First Amendment. Restricting campaign finance could therefore be seen as infringing upon these fundamental rights, as Citizens United ruled. So Citizens United is a key example of this. The court ruled that corporate funding of independent political broadcasts couldn't be limited, citing freedom of speech. And this reflects, as I mentioned, the viewpoint that monetary contributions to com political campaigns are a form of free speech. And restricting this ability could therefore be seen as restricting a fundamental democratic right and undermining US democracy. Enforcing greater regul regulation is very difficult to achieve and can have unintended consequences. So implementing and enforcing stricter campaign finance laws can be practically challenging and lead to unintended consequences such as the rise of unregulated or less transparent sources of funding. Post McCain, Feingold reforms, the proliferation of soft money and the emergence of 527 organisations demonstrated how attempts at regulation could lead to the creation of new loopholes. These entities, often operating in grey areas of law, circumvented the intended restrictions of campaign financing reforms. Further, the Supreme Court's current um, interpretation of spending on political campaigns and free speech makes any regulation or any legislation um, that would be effective extremely difficult. And finally, it can be argued that actually the impact of campaign financing on electoral outcomes is overstated. The influence of campaign financing on electoral outcomes is often exaggerated. There are notable instances where candidates who spend less have triumphed over those with significantly um, larger war chests, suggesting um, the factors other than financial resources are critical um, in determining election results. In the 2016 presidential election, Trump spent considerably less than Hillary Clinton, but still emerged victorious. Clinton's campaign and her supporting groups outspent Trump's campaign by a substantial margin, with her campaign spending approximately $768 million compared to Trump's roughly $398 million. But despite this financial disadvantage, Trump won the election illustrating that while campaign funds are important, they're not the sole determinant of electoral success. Further, Bloomberg's campaign in the 2020 presidential um, primary for the Democratic side is a key example of this, um, spending substantial amounts of money has limited electoral success or can do. Bloomberg spent over a, million, a billion dollars on this campaign, one of the largest self-funded political campaigns in US history. But despite this immense expenditure, he failed to gain significant traction and won only a handful of delegates indicating that money alone cannot secure electoral success. So yeah, um, that was everything in relation to campaign financing, including um, kind of an introduction to it, the role of Supreme Court decisions, the role of legislation and key debates in relation to it. Let me know if you've got any comments or questions in the comment section below, and I'll be back um, in the next couple of videos, which are going to be on the Republican and the Democratic parties.